Tonight's message is titled, The Road Less Travelled. And it uh, comes from Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. And it follows on from a scripture that I referenced this morning. And this is what it says. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now, Jesus is telling us about navigating through life. Now, why is it so important? Why is it so important? Why, why can't the road to life be wide? Why does it have to be narrow and hard to find? Well, I, I can tell you one thing. This is my thought on the subject. Anything of value, anything of value requires a cost. If you get something for nothing, you don't value it. And you end up tossing it away, throwing it away. But if, if it's something of value, it costs. Have a guess what? You, you are of value. It cost God an awful lot for you. It cost him his son. And he willingly gave up his life for you because you are worth it. And he thought the cost was worth paying the price. I've gone off. Oi, come back. I thought I'd, I thought I'd, I thought I'd found the... Ah, here we go. Here we are. I thought I'd found the magic little button that kept this thing from doing that, but obviously not. Technology. It's wonderful. But anyway, see, tell you a little story. Before I got my little red car out there, everywhere we went, I used to look up the destination in something that was called the street directory. I think they still make them, still sell them. But, you know, I, you get more and more cars these days with this wonderful thing called a sat-nav. And I use it all the time now. In fact, um, um, I don't know how I ever got by without it, to tell you the honest truth. <laughs> These things, I dig my heels in and say, no, 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 I don't want those things. So when I get them, just like my smartphone, I didn't really think I needed a smartphone. And when I lost it that time coming back from Port Macquarie, I was, it was disaster day. It was like, well, what am I going to do? And I thought, what, you idiot. You, you, know, you were the one that said you didn't want one. Now you've got one you can't do without it. It's, it's, it's amazing. But, see, the book, the old street directories was full of information and uh, how to get places and all that kind of stuff. And, and, but you still needed to decipher what's in it, okay? You get your little street directory and you need to decipher it. And one of the good things to start with is make sure that the map is up the right way. That always helps. That always helps. See... I have found that not everybody can, in fact, read a map. Okay? I'll, I'll embarrass my wife. Okay, go on. All right. This is many, many years ago, okay, when we first started going out. And uh, we were in um, uh, this friends of ours. They were in this Scottish uh, Highland dance thing. Uh, it was like a club sort of thing. And they had a they had a, a Jim Carner, and uh, okay, so I, I turn up in my hotted up car with my brand new girlfriend Jacqueline to uh, around, to go on this Jim Carner, and so okay, you're reading the map. Now I didn't know at this stage. Uh, I thought everybody could read a map, so I gave Jackie the map and said, okay, this is where we got to get to. You know, uh, we never got there. <laughs> we never got there. We did see some interesting places. I remember going down some right, this track, and I thought, this can't be right. Because, I mean, it was a track. It was not a road. It wasn't even formed. It was just, and there's my, my low-slung, hotted-up car going down this goat track. And, uh, yeah, so you can imagine how I felt. So, but, you know, the, so not everybody can read a map. And now we've got sat-nav. We don't have to worry. 
She never. Oh, well, I must have meant this. That was um, how many years ago was that? That's got. It's got to be. Well, it's, it's got to be forty-five years ago. We did that. So it's a long, long time. Have a guess what? She still can't read a map. But that's okay. You didn't marry the widow. I didn't marry. That's right, Bob. I didn't marry her to. Look, mate. I knew. I knew after that that if we could get, we could get through that. We could get through anything. Because we we, we were we were just going out. We weren't even engaged at that stage. We were just going out, and uh, uh, and uh, so so that's a long time ago now. But anyway, where am I? Okay. To get anywhere in life, it's important to know where you're going. And more so in your Christian walk. For sometimes the way ahead can seem to be a bit fuzzy. And things are not strictly black and white. You know, uh, I think we're all pretty good with the black and the white. You know, we, it's either good or it's bad. But it's uh, those times, those issues which are not quite black, not quite white. They're that fuzzy little grey area. Sometimes we can get ourselves in a little bit of a mess with. But, you know, we do have a street directory that's written for us, and it's, it's called the Bible. And if we follow the instructions in that Bible, then our destination is clear, and how to get there is clear. You know, when I got my new car... No, it's not so new now, but it, 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 and I still haven't worked it out. But getting the sat nav and I punch in where I wanted to go, and then off I I go and I go down this street, you know, because I think oh, that's a shortcut, to, you know, to uh, Jerobomba Avenue or whatever, and uh, and and the car would go at the next roundabout, take the left, take a right, take a left, take a right, or whatever. He wanted me to go somewhere else, uh, and, and until you know. And if I didn't do that, it would tell me again. I'd go past that street and it would say, take the next right. And it would keep telling me all the time, you're going the wrong way, basically. Go back, go back, go back, go back. Until eventually it got sick of it or whatever and decided that it was going to redirect me and it would work out where I wanted to go and, and then it, we, we'd get there, you know. But, you know, it recalculate, yeah. Uh, it, it says root recalculation, it keeps saying. Uh, well, that's when it finally works out that, I'm not going to turn around and I'm going to keep going. So I haven't got the hang of that programming yet and I probably never will because it still keeps telling me that. And I've had it to about three years now. So, you know, who knows? Another three years I might have got it worked out. Probably not. Yes, yeah, she could do. Yeah. Could she could, who knows? She keeps me on the straight and narrow most of the time. So that's good. We all need a barometer in our lives, folks. Um, and I've got a good one, so, and you can't have her, okay? See, moin. <laughs> moin. Yeah, so it's, but anyway, I'm, I'm off the track. Where am I going? You know, in our spiritual uh, walk, in, in our travels along our spiritual road, we often. You know, like those warnings, in our spiritual walk, we can get warnings. We can get things come up and God can speak to us and, and tell us that, oh, ooh, hang on a minute, you're not quite right here. You're off the track. And what we can do, like me and my sat nav, we can just ignore it and keep going. Or we can take notice of those warnings and turn around and do something a bit different. Get us to where we want to go. See, me ignoring the uh, um, the warnings on the sat nav um, in the car are not that great. I mean, I might get lost in Gungalan, but then anybody can get lost in Gungalan. So you know, or even even good old um, Gugong. My map still hasn't caught up with Gugong. So I, even my my daughter's street is not in sat nav. I'm sitting in the middle of a paddock when I go to my daughter's place. It's like nothing there. But, you know, but that's Gugong. But see, but getting lost in your spiritual walk 
has far more reaching consequences. You know, it's not that simple. You know, if you get lost in your spiritual walk, sometimes it can take an awful lot getting back to where you want to be. But God is good. All the time. All the time God is good. But God is good. And he knows. He knows how we're made up. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he knows that sometimes we are going to um, wander a little bit. But if we're true to our faith, then we listen and we come back. And God is good and he lets us do that. See, the first time I ever used sat-nav, I've t- told you this before, was in, in my da- daughter's car. That's a quite, a, quite some a number of years ago now. And then it, she'd been uh, posted to uh, New Zealand for two years, so, so her car sat in my garage. And after about 12 months, she rang me up and said, Dad, have you taken the car for a ride? And I went, no. <laughs> was I supposed to? Yeah. It's been sitting there for 12 months doing nothing. So, okay, I'll take it. Now, I decided to go to Inverell. I thought I'll take it for a nice long drive. I will go to Inverell. Now, I've been to Inverell many, many times. So I know the way, basically, you know, like the back of my hand. So, but I thought for a bit of fun, this car had this sat-nav thing. I'd never tried it before, so I thought, well, I'll give it a go. Let's punch in Inverell in the sat-nav and, and off we go. And, and it came up with a list of um, options. And it said the quickest route or the shortest route. And I went, Yeah, that'll do me. So I punched the button. Ah, wrong. (laughs) Big mistake. We went down some roads I would never, ever envisage going down. We saw some beautiful country. But it twisted and turned. It went uphill, down dale. It it went everywhere. It was the shortest route because it went that way where I normally go up on the main road and then come across. But... See, this way it was doing maybe 20 or 30 kilometres an hour in places because there was hairpin bends and all sorts of things. Going the way I normally go is 100k all the way. Right? So I spent about two and a half hours longer going the short route than I did by sticking to the main road. And there's a, there's a, um, there's a bit of a, a thing in, in that. You know, sometimes taking a shortcut it's not a shortcut at all. And when we try that in our spiritual walk with God, taking a shortcut is not always a shortcut. Okay? You've got to be careful what you do. Sometimes sticking to the tried and the true is better than trying something different. But it was fun. Yeah, it was very fun. You see, taking shortcuts has been with mankind ever since Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were tempted with a very subtle, did God really say that? There was no no real out front uh, uh, challenging the word of God or whatever. Just did God say that? Just a little doubt dropped into somebody's head. And the consequences of that is, is what we know is that uh, man fell and we've been, I guess mankind's been paying for it ever since. But God gave us a way out and that way is Jesus Christ. See, Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 and then again in chapter 16 verse 25 says this, There is a way that appears to be right but in the end it leads to death. You know, we all want to be in charge, don't we? It's just something that's built into us. We, you know, some of us are more um, uh, outgoing than others. Some of us are more uh, predisp- predisposition to be uh, uh, to be leaders, and so on. But we all want to be in charge of our life. We don't like being told what to do, do we? You know. If I was to tell you, you can't sit in the back row, you've got to sit in the front, you'd tell me to go jump. You're going to sit wherever you want to sit. Hey, fair enough, you can. You know, well, We all want to be in charge. That's probably a little 
uh, not not quite a good uh, uh, analogy, but you know you get the you get the drift. You know, the old back goes up when somebody tells you that you can't do something. You know, because because when it really boils down to it, we think we're smarter than what we are. Really? Oh, thank you. Thank you, right? <laughs> Where's the rest of you at the back? What are you doing up there? Ah, oh, that's okay. Ah, you can you can stay there, fellas. You're all right. Okay. So we all, we all think that we're smarter than we are, but we're really not too, you know, we're not too flash in a pan. Unless we're looking at Scripture and doing what Scripture tells us. This is what David said in Psalm 18. From verse 30, it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word, the Lord's word is flawless. And it's done it to me again. Whoop. Back here, you. He shields all who take refuge in him. For who, be, who is God beside the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It's good then that we have a clear instruction on how, on how to navigate our way through to our destination. Unlike flat pack instructions from a certain store that we won't name, we can access someone who can teach us what we need to know as we go along. So he, he doesn't he doesn't speak to us in words that we can't understand, and he doesn't show us things that we can't do. The scripture says that he, you know, whatever he asks you to do, he will give you the, uh, the, the everything you need to be able to accomplish to do it. You know, if you're going to be a prophet, he will give you the gift of prophecy. If you're going to be a teacher, he'll give you the gift of teaching. If you're if you're uh, going to be uh, a giver, he'll give you the gift of being a good giver, a giver that doesn't, um, you know who just gives and loves giving, doesn't sort of give it with grudgingness or anything like that. So, so God will make sure that you are fully prepared for what he's asking you to do. He won't ask you to do anything and then just stand back and say, well, there you go. And then when you, know, when you make, make a mess of it, you turn around and go, well, I told you. <laughs> and God will make sure that you are fully <laughs> equipped to do what you need to do according to his word. See, David in Psalm 27 shows us that the Lord can teach us how to walk in his ways and not to be distracted by the things that uh, leap, at, leap out at us. You know. There's lots of things in this modern day that can get in the way. Uh, subtle things that sound good but a little eternal value. David said this, teach me your way, Lord. <coughs> Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. You know, David, as I said this morning, was a man that was, uh, had a lot of uh, trouble in his life. He went through a lot of uh, stress. He had a lot of things happening. You know, he had uh, Saul trying to kill him. And, and, uh, um, and then uh, um, his son tried to kill him, led a rebellion. Uh, you know, so he had a lot of uh, oppression in his life. But he was constantly giving God the praise and the glory for what God was doing in his life. You see, there is only one way that we can get salvation. There is only one way. There is only one path that we can lead, that, that we can take that leads to salvation. And that is through Jesus. And John 14 verse 6 tells us this. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, through Jesus. And as I said before, you know, the road to salvation is by necessity narrow. Because it's worth finding anything of any value is worth finding. It's worth paying a price for. You know, the scripture, which I haven't got down, but this comes to mind when uh, about the, the woman who lost the coin, turned the house upside down, 
looking for that lost coin. And then when she found it, she went running to her neighbours and said, come celebrate with me. The coin that I lost, I found. You know, that's, you're that coin. You're that coin. And when you came to the Lord, there was that celebration. The word says that, you know, there's a lot of celebrating over one sinner who repents. The 99 others that don't need repentance. But we all need repentance. Nobody's good. You know, Jesus wants to wants us to follow him. And there's something about Jesus that compels people to do so. You see, when you see the first disciples, they were doing what fishermen normally do. They were down by their boats. They were mending nets. They were cleaning fish. They were doing whatever fishermen do. I can't catch fish, so I don't really know. Jack has tried. He will try again, he tells me. But next time, next time, I will catch a fish. Might only be a tiny one, but it'll be a fish. Might have to throw it back. Yes, make sure I take the wrapping paper off it first before I take it home, yes. Yeah. yes. But anyway, this is what uh, we see, what happened in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. He says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. I find that amazing. I find that amazing. You know, here comes this complete stranger. Wouldn't know him from a bar of soap. And he walks up to you and says, come follow me. Stop doing what you're doing, okay? And you've, they've been fishermen for all their lives, okay? They, that's all they knew. And he said, come follow me. As simple as that. And they did. I, I find that amazing. There's something about the presence of Jesus that just compels people to change. And you know something? He hasn't changed. He's the same now as he was then. And when he talks to you and says to you, come follow me, there's something about that come follow me that you have to do. I don't know what it is, but it just speaks to you and you know, you know that you have been, you know, that you have an encounter with the wine, the one, the holy God, and you just know it. And your life changes. You see, life for those men would have been simple, pretty simple. Go out, catch fish, throw a net in, catch fish. But as simple as it is, it could have been, it would have been pretty hard, see, because nature controlled everything they did. You know, if, if, if it was too stormy, they couldn't go out, Okay. If it rained, they couldn't go out. If the fish weren't biting, they went hungry. If the nets broke, they couldn't go fishing until they fixed them. A lot better at tying knots than I am, I must admit. I'd hate to see what a net would look like after I'd been at it for a while. But see, they had this very simple life, but... You, uh, had his word, they left it. They, they, they walked away and followed him. And their life never was the same. They walked off into a world of the unknown. They didn't know who he was or what he was going to do. He just asked them to come and, and they came. But at that time, they didn't know who he was. They didn't know he was the son of God. They didn't know that he was going to set the world on fire or they were going to set the world on fire. But they did. They just left. But see, like us, they're human. 
And you see, if you follow their, uh, follow their scripture, or follow them through scripture, you see that even though they saw m- miraculous signs and, and wonders and all sorts of things, they still had difficulty in, in accepting who he was. See, so if, you, if you're having difficulty in accepting who Jesus was, then you're not on your own. You're not on your own. But the thing is, God never gave up on them and he'll never give up on you either. And if you have a doubt, you take it to God and God will show you the answer. This is what Philip said in John chapter 14, verse 8. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. You know, Jesus did miracle after miracle after miracle. You know. Some of the things he did, only God could do. He raised the widow's son. Can you imagine that? There's this funeral procession coming out of the city. And Jesus is walking in and he walks over and says, hang on a minute, stop. Because he knows that that is the only son of this woman. And he says, stop, stop the procession. Young man, get up. And he did. Wow. He gave the woman back her son. Because there's no Centrelink in those days. There's no there's no widow's pension. The son provides for the mother. She was a widow. She didn't have a husband leave to look after her. She only had a son. And Jesus gave her back her son. You know, so you know, just as a word, as an aside, if you've got somebody in your family who's away from the God, who's away from the Lord, don't worry. The Lord can give them back. He's not short on, on doing miracles. When we look at things and we see impossibilities or roadblocks or brick walls, and God sees only the possibility. He only sees good things, not not things that are there to stop us. You see, the disciples questioned to the end what the role of Jesus was and, and why he had come to the world. The Jewish nation was expecting someone to, li- to deliver them from the Romans. They were looking for somebody to restore the kingdom of, of Israel back to its glory back to this former glory jesus however had come with a different a different agenda he'd come to restore all mankind to god not just israel and jesus goes on to say that those who believe in him would do greater things through the power of the help of the spirit of god the holy spirit he says this very truly I, i tell you whoever believes in me will do the works i have been doing And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and be and will be in you. Okay, that's the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you're born again, true born again believer, God gives you that Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there for lots of things, but He's there primarily to guide you, to teach you, to confirm God's word. It's always interesting 
when you have a little, you know, you have a little niggling doubt there or something, God will come along and he'll do something that you may not expect. You know, he may speak to you through a message. He may speak to you through a song. He may speak to you through a person that just happens to be uh, sitting at the next table or somebody that you just happen to bump into. I love how these things just happen. But God has a, a way of, of, of maneuvering things and making things so that if you're open and you're listening, you can have your answer. But you've got to be listening. See, Jesus tells us that we're not alone. He's given us our own internal sat-nav through the Holy Spirit to guide us. See, he said this, he says, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I leave, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. We're all intertwined with Jesus. No matter which way you look at it, whichever way you come at it, upside down, back to front, inside out, I don't care. You all are wrapped up in Jesus, and Jesus is wrapping you up. He tells us to keep his instructions, and his instructions are pretty simple. He says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, who is not Judas Iscariot, said, but Lord... Why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. See, Jesus reveals himself to believers. And he also reveals himself to those that want to believe. The Bible says, you know, he stands at the door knocking. Well, that door is everybody. And he's knocking at everybody's door. But not everybody opens it. It's, that's a funny door, you see. It's a funny door in the fact that there's only one handle. It's, I, uh, every time I've ever thought about the scripture and have a thought about this door, all I ever see is the door with one handle. What side of the door is the handle on? Your side. Your side. Because it's you that opens the door. And God doesn't force himself on anybody. He, he's given us all free will. But when we take that step, God is on the other side of the door and, and God will just come in and, and he does and he has. And from that point onwards, your life changes and things become different. You have a different perspective on life. You know, you don't, um, you know, I mean, um, not that I was a bad person. I don't know how you describe a person good, bad or indifferent, but, you know. But I did have a few peculiarities. One being that uh, being a palm, I didn't like my heritage being uh, disdained upon. And uh, on a few occasions, I let people know when they said something about my... Because uh, I used to have a little bit broader accent in my earlier years. And I would, uh, when people would criticize or make comment about my pommy accent... I would ruffle up like you wouldn't want to believe. And, uh, you know, but God has taken all that and sort of calmed me down somewhat. Uh, a lot. Yeah. So, you know, and uh, um, so he does change. It, it may only be subtle, but he does change you, okay? He takes things away from you that you don't need, okay? And he replaces them with things that you do need. Patience, peace. The ability to read a map. <laughs> Maybe not. You see, 
the good thing about being born again is, is what it says. It says. This is what Jesus says. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. You see, so inside of us, we all have this, I guess, the, the ability to tap into this encyclopedia of what God wants to say to you if you're willing to listen. You see, and again, what I, another scripture that I used this morning, it gives us something that the world is desperate for. And, and you have it in spades. You have it in abundance, and the, the world is looking for it. And, and especially in the last few weeks, few months, with, the, um, with this coronavirus going on and, and what have you, the people are, are running around you know, in, in, a, in a panic. And this is what Jesus said. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. And then he said, come now, let us leave. You see, Jesus gives us this peace that passes all understanding. It's something that you, until you need it, you don't understand it. But when you're in the middle of, uh, you know, like you're in a, you know, you're in the uh, spin cycle of your washing machine, and life just seems to be going all over the place, you can have this peace. You, you don't understand it, but in the midst of everything that's happening, you can have this peace. And people look at you and go, you're stupid. <laughs> Why aren't you running around, you know, like a chick with your head chopped off like everybody else? Well, it's because I've got the peace of God. And I get it. I got it through Jesus. He gave it to me, free gift. You can have it too. And, and it doesn't matter what the World Health Organization might say or, or anything else. It's what God says about you and to you that matters. You see, when I started the message... Uh, when I'm just about finished, could you play that? I quoted the words Jesus spoke about there being two roads. You see, one is wide and it's seemingly full of life's pleasures. It's easy to find, it's probably well lit, a bit like a Las Vegas strip or something, neon signs everywhere, flashing lights. And it looks inviting, it looks, you know, it, it, yeah, it looks pretty good. But the end of that road is there's nothing. There's nothing except separation from God for eternity. You know, the scripture where um, the rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus being a, 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 a beggar full of sores and, and, and what have you, lying outside the rich man's gate and all he got all his life was just the dregs off the rich man's table. And when they died, Lazarus, the, the beggar, ended up in heaven. And the rich man ended up in he hell. But he was in hell and he could look out and he could see Lazarus in, the, in heaven being fed and being comforted and being looked after. You know, and here he is, you know, he's in hell, he's in pain, he's in the fire, he's in, he's in all sorts of woeful place. And he says, you know, says to Abraham, you know, send somebody, you know, send Lazarus. And he said, no, Lazarus can't go back. He said, send, send, send somebody else. i got brothers at home. Go and tell them about this place. Tell them how bad it is. Tell them not to come here. And Abraham said, that can't happen. You can't come from there to here, and we can't go from here to there. So right now, right now, 
You've got a choice. Because you're in neither of those places right now. Right now. But the choice you've got right now is where do you want to end up? Now, you might, that might be, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm getting, I'm close to 70, so I don't know. Another 30, another 40 years, who knows? <laughs> who knows? You know, some of you are a lot younger. You might have 70 or 80 years left. But at some point, at some point, you will be wherever you decide to be. And now is the time to make a decision where you want to be. See? The road that Jesus wants us to take is the small and the narrow one. You know, it leads up. The other one leads down. The narrow road leads up. And I don't want to sugarcoat it because the road up is full of obstacles. It's not, you know, it's not this four-lane highway that's leading you to destruction and to oblivion. It's a, it's a goat track sometimes. It's full of obstacles. It's full of, um, it's full of difficulties. But in everything, God gives you the peace. He gives you peace. He gives you the character to overcome things. Being an overcomer is what it's all about. You know, you can take the easy route, the low road, as it were. You know, you could take the easy route. But that's not what God wants for you. God wants you in his kingdom. You see, and I've heard people say that they're hanging on by their fingertips. And hanging on by your fingertips is, is, is okay, if that's what it takes. But hanging on by your fingertips can't last forever. You eventually run out of strength. You will eventually let go. See, the way I want to look at it is 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 more of a is more of a uh, you know like a well, like me and my grandkids. You know, uh, I give them big hugs. Whenever they come to my house, they get a big hug. Uh, even the even the oldest gets a big hug. He, he's 18. He doesn't quite like it, but he still gets one. Okay, and I, that's how I picture God giving you a big hug. And it's not so much you hanging on by your fingertips, but it's you embracing God with that big hug, that big bear hug. You know that He comes around and He gives you a big smushy grin. You know, that's God, because God's a father. He's your father. He doesn't treat you any different than you would treat your own children. Hopefully you will treat your own children you know, wisely and well and when you see them, give them a big hug. But see, that's how I see it. That's how I see Jesus hanging on. Hanging on to me. Hanging on to you. You can see yourself as hanging on to him if you want. But so much better to see him hanging on to you. Because it's not your strength that's being used in this dirty great big bear hug. It's his strength. And he's the one that's doing all the hugging. All you've got to do is just sit back and take it. There's a poem. It was written in 1936 by a 14-year-old by the name of Mary Stevenson. And most people know it. And probably most people have got it. It's called Footprints in the Sand. And this is how it goes, and I'll finish my message here with this poem. One night I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Many scenes from my life flashed across the sky. In each scene I noticed footprints in the sand. Sometimes there were two sets of footprints. Other times there was one set of footprints. This bothered me because I noticed that during the low periods of my life, when I was suffering from anguish, sorrow, or defeat, I could see only one set of footprints. So I said to the Lord, You promised me, Lord, that if I followed you, you would walk with me always. But I have noticed that during the most trying periods of my life, there have only been one set of footprints in the sand. Why, when I needed you most, you have not been there for me? And the Lord replied, 
The times when you have seen only one set of footprints is when I carried you. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will make your journey less of a struggle. He will make your path straight. You will be the overcomer that the Word tells you you are. Have no doubt. Believe that all things are possible. See, it's time to reprogram your sat-nav. Get yourself some proper instruction. Learn from Jesus the way to travel. There are two roads that you can travel on. Please be careful which one you choose. Amen.